definitely happened, I guess, some some time in the 1990s, uh, that suddenly like uh, the nerd. It was almost like an like an appropriation of hate speech in a certain way. Like you take it, uh, you, you take that term and, and wear it as a badge of honor and, and, and turn its meaning on, on 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 the head or something like that. I think that definitely happened. Yeah. I mean, the term is also not that old. I mean, I think uh, I, I did some research back then for for Trace Route, uh, my film about nerd culture, and the, the, the first time like that nerd is being used by a wider population is in the late 70s and early 1980s. Johannes Grinsferdner joins John and Scoop from Austria as the Plutopia podcast explores nerd culture, context hacking, sex and technology, cocktail robotics, and his new film, Hacking Threshold. Hey everybody, welcome to the Plutopia News Network podcast. Here we are with another episode, and this one is, uh, going to be a very interesting discussion with Johannes Grinsferdner. He's a happily subversive artist, a filmmaker, author, and performer. Johannes is based in Vienna, Austria, and he's founder and director of Monochrome, which is an international art and theory collective that I've been aware of for a long time, two decades. He'll be premiering his latest film, Masking Threshold, at Fantastic Fest in Austin. So, just kind of starting out here, uh, Boing Boing, uh, with which I think we both have some associations, has referred to you as a leet nerd. Yeah, a light nerd, I guess. Light like, nerd, is it? Is light, that how you pronounce yeah. it? Light nerd. Light nerd, yes. <laughs> what do they mean when they say that? Well, okay, there is... Uh... It, 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 it's a double joke, I guess, because uh, first of all, there's this German term that came up a couple of years ago, and it's uh, uh, the term Leitkultur, and Leitkultur is something like a mainstream culture, and the term is usually used, I would say, by conservatives or even right-wingers in German, because they, of course, want to claim the Leitkultur, they want to be the dominant culture. I think uh, something uh, like in the US would be the discourse about, I don't know, like white privilege or something like that. So there's a dominant culture. And of course, in German, it should be the German culture, the, the conservative German culture should be the dominant culture. So there's this term light culture and light pretty much like means leading, like the mm -hmm. leading culture. And uh, if they refer to me as the, as the light nerd, I'm the leading nerd. Uh, but they also know it's coming from this like conservative term. So it's almost like an ironic term to call me something that's even slightly referring to conservatism, I guess. <laughs> but, eh, you know. It's funny. I guess leading could mean mainstream, but it could also mean avant-garde, you know, that you're at, it, at it the could be. forefront, it could be. Yeah, which yeah. is, of course, that's more applicable to you, right? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I think that's that's the double double meaning of the word and, and, and the play with it. Yeah. Well, before we talk about kind of your history and, and go back into the past, I'd like to ask you about Masking Threshold. I don't know very much about it. That is the film that's going to premiere at Fantastic Fest this month. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, uh, yes. So it's a horror film, is that correct? It is correct, yes. Uh, it's my, it's like my my new feature film it's not a documentary my last two films were documentaries and this time i thought it's time again to do the, like a classic fictional film and so you referred to it already so a couple of years ago uh, it was released in 2016 i did this film called uh, trace route and trace route is almost like a on the one hand it's a road trip a, a, like a road movie about nerds but it's also in a certain way, an autobiography about my my own life and where I come from and why I consider myself being a nerd. And in general, I think Trace Route is about the positive aspects of nerd culture, like in a, in a positive way, the subversive and the, and the, the countercultural aspects and the, the revolutionary aspects that you can think of when you think of nerd culture. Of course, there are a ton of like negative things that you can talk about too when you talk about nerds and uh, you know, like don't even have to go into Gamergate and stuff like that. But I mean, there is definitely a lot of negative aspects of, of nerd culture. But in, in Trace Route, I was 
talking about the obsessiveness and the positive uh, obsessiveness of nerd culture. And with uh, Masking Threshold, I'm kind of returning to the theme of, of what a nerd is or what, what uh, how, how nerds could be portrayed. But it, as you mentioned, it's a horror film. So in a certain way, it is the dark side of the nerd. Like if your obsessiveness and your focus and your uh, kind of like only kind of like digging into one thing or, or if your obsessiveness leads you uh, into like the dark corners, that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about uh, with Masking Threshold. So uh, not too many people know about it. Only a handful of people have seen it. So the world premiere is next week in Austin, uh, which I'm very happy about. It's almost like, like w winning the jackpot. I mean, it's a very small indie film. I made it for $15,000, this like really, really small, pretty much like shot it in my, in my apartment. By the way, I shot it in this room, <laughs> the room right behind me. That's where I shot the film. Wow! With with Florian, my my uh, my camera guy, and uh, so I don't, I don't want to give away too much, but uh, the story pretty much is about a very uh, uh, scientifically thinking nerdy character, like an IT technician, and that guy he studied physics and he's very much into. Like, like you know skepticism and and uh, being very critical about religion and all that stuff so the classic he's, he's also a big fan of of people like i don't know like uh, uh christopher hitchens and, and and stuff like that and uh or or um uh what's his name uh the guy who actually came up with the meme theory richard dawkins P people like that people like that he like likes those people a lot and that character uh for a couple of years has a tin, uh, tinnitus and uh, so it's very debilitating and he and he he went to a lot of doctors and tried to find out what's what's with his hearing why does he have this hearing impairment and so far you've pretty well described me <laughs> you have tinnitus <laughs> i do Oh, really? Okay. Well, I did. I don't have tinnitus myself, but I did a lot of research for the film and talked to many people who have tinnitus. And I mean, I have like a whole stack of books and I read everything that I could find out about tinnitus. And so the story is uh, that he kind of like gives up on talking to doctors anymore. The doctors want, don't want to help him. They pretty much say like what you describe, the kind of tinnitus that you have. Uh, that's not really existing. It's it's kind of weird what you're describing. It's probably all psychosomatic. So he gives up on that. He wasted a lot of money on 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 doctors and, and medical bills already. So he decides he wants to lock himself up in his room and start experiments and try to find out what's with the noise in my head. Where does it come from? Are there things that modify it or change it? And uh, well, and uh, yeah, the film, what, what can I say? It's a horror film. It doesn't end good. <laughs> it sounds like a pretty typical tinnitus sufferer. Tinnitus really is not curable as far as anybody seems to know. But if you're, well, if you're like me, for instance, I just, it just blends into the background and I don't even think about it. If I do start thinking about it, it could potentially drive me crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I would do anything like horrific, uh, but I could certainly do some wall climbing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, that, yeah. Yeah. That, I, that sounds I, I, like I, a pretty good framework. Yeah. No, I, I, I try to wanted something that, uh, that, that people can relate to because even if, you don't have tinnitus yourself. It's something that you heard about. Or I mean, I also mentioned that in the film because of course he talks a lot about tinnitus and, and refers to a lot of research in the film. Uh, so, I mean, every adult pretty much has tinnitus for at least five minutes in his or her life. It happens sometimes only for a short period of time. So. Or, or you went to kind of like a rock concert or something like that, and you have like some debilitation for a couple of hours or something like that. And luckily for most people, it goes away, but for some people it doesn't. And then there are, of course, so many different 
uh, ways how you can get it. You can have like really like a, a damage of your brain stem. You can have like all kinds of stuff. Uh, and I kind of wanted to do something that is rooted in reality, but at the same time is something that you, as you, you're watching a film that, and you, of course, I'm playing in the soundscape and in the in the soundtrack of the film, I'm playing with noise and, uh, and stuff like that. But it's never clear if what you're hearing is what the protagonist is hearing, or if it if that's just like you know like the soundtrack, or is this like something that that is just like added for you never like I, I keep it a little bit uh, experimental and also mysterious what's going on. And in the end, you don't really know if whatever he describes is really true and he just goes insane because of that or if he goes insane because of uh, other trauma that, that he suffered through or something like that. So I, I, I keep it quite ambivalent. But uh, yeah, that, I guess that's part of the fun uh, to play with, uh, like, uh, with, your, with your or your protagonist's brain, I guess. Well, the uh, whole idea of tinnitus, yeah, I think we all, it was self-inflicted because we all went to a lot of really loud concerts. I know I did. I worked at a lot of concerts. So being an audio producer, that, you know, it's terrifying to me when I have tinnitus coming on and I'm trying to get a decent mix on someone. But it's just something you have to deal with. But, you know, back to your talk about nerd culture. There was a time I remember when nerd was used as an insult. That was hurled at you because people thought you were too bookish or you were too into technology. And that was a, a bad thing in some parts of at least American culture. And suddenly it became kind of a badge of honor for people who were, you know, when the, uh, the whole idea of, uh, nerdism became popular in, in popular culture, then suddenly it was no longer a, uh, a negative thing you threw at people. It was something to be proud of. And I, I, I was always confused of, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, how, it, it, how it, it, transitioned. it, yeah, it, it definitely happened, I guess, some, some time in the 1990s, uh, that suddenly like, uh, the nerd, it was almost like um like an appropriation of hate speech in a certain way. Like you take it, uh, you you take that term and and wear it as a badge of honor and and, and turn its meaning on 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 the head or something like that. I think that definitely happened. Yeah. I mean, the term is also not that old. I mean, I think uh, I, I did some research back then for for Trace Route, uh, my film about nerd culture, and the, the the first time like that nerd is being used by a wider population is in the late 70s and early 1980s. Uh, and it's not even quite clear where it's coming from. There are some theories that it's actually from a Dr. Seuss book. Yeah, if I ran the zoo. Yeah, exactly. There is the nerd and the seersuckler and stuff like that. They're like weird made up names. And, uh, but, but there, are, there, are, there are a couple of theories. And it's interesting, you, you showed uh, uh, the, the Wikipedia page about, uh, about nerds. If you want to go back to that, you'll actually find my name there <laughs> because they, they are referring to the film that I made on that page, which, of course, I take as a big badge of honor that I'm on the official page about nerds on Wikipedia. <laughs> Let me show that here. Whoa. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. And if you if you scroll down, yeah, there, there it goes. Yeah. There it is. Oh, yeah, uh, you're quoted on there. That's great. I, I, I'm quoted. Yeah, yeah. It was an interview that I gave, uh, like, in the same interview, Boeing Boeing refers to me as the light nerd. Uh, the one thing that you, you quoted before, that's from the same interview. 2016, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, do you want to you read this thing here? That, uh, well, I mean, because I can, the people I, I, who I, I, are no, hearing... No, it's not necessary to... To, to read it, but I can give like a short abstract what I mean with that. I think is I think that that it, it's 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 mentioned in there that I think in the beginning that the nerd was uh, kind of like a stereotypical thing that especially was used in in comedies. I remember there was this uh, when when I grew up as a kid, I liked it a lot. It was like a like a late seventies, early eighties TV series that probably nobody. 
uh, remembers, it was called Riptide. I'm not sure if you remember that. And it was, uh, uh, it was this kind of like, like an action comedy series about two Vietnam, no, actually three Vietnam vets. And two of them are these like private investigators. And one of them is like this super nerdy character called Mary Buzinski, who builds robots and stuff like that. So who is the, he's the brainy one of the trio. And in German, they even translated uh, the whole title with uh, Trio mit vier Fäusten, uh, which means like a trio, like three people. So uh, a trio, but they only have four fists because the other guy, like fists number five and six are never used because they belong to the nerd and the nerd would never use the fists or something like that. It's kind of weird. It's one of these like bizarre things that probably nobody in America remembers, but I remember it quite vividly because uh, Austrian television, there were only two channels in Austria at that time when I grew up. Uh, so we didn't have you know, like commercial television. So there were two channels and whatever they were airing on those two channels, of course, you would watch as a kid. And one of the, those things was that stupid TV series called Riptide. And I remember that I really liked that character. I liked it because, because he, he, he was funny. He built interesting, weird things. But at the same time, he was always the clumsy person. He, he was the person who had a lot of brains, but he didn't know how to put the right gear into... When he, when he was driving, he was taking the wrong gear and would drive backwards, uh, some slapsticky kind of thing. So the nerd was always, uh, at least in that time when I grew up, a kind of comic comic relief character. He was, or she were like, they, they were in, interesting for, for the plot and they were useful, uh, but they were kind of always kind of like, ah, you never know, like you don't want to be that person. Uh, and uh, at some point that actually changed. And I think probably 10, 15 years later, that character suddenly became something like a main character. Uh, now we're talking about uh, there's uh, like the Matrix number four is coming out. And the main character in the Matrix, Neo, is kind of like a stereotypical nerd, actually. Just like 10, 15 years before that, it would not have been possible to make a film like that with a nerd as the main character. The thing about Big Bang Theory, which was a highly successful television series here in the U.S. that was all about nerds. I mean, yeah. except for one person, they were all nerds. Yeah, yeah. And she worked in the Cheesecake Factory, as far as I yeah. remember. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, something like uh, Big Bang Theory is almost something like nerdploitation or something like that. I don't know, because I'm not really sure if I like it or not. I watched it a couple of times. I'm not sure I really enjoyed it. But at some point, but I'm, it's true, at some point, nerds were so uh, acceptable in mainstream culture that you could do something like uh, Big Bang Theory. Well, when, when the internet appeared, and especially when I was doing Fringeware, which you'll, I'm sure, recall. Absolutely. Um, it was sort of like the nerds will inherit the earth. I mean, we realized that there's people that you might refer to as nerds or kind of fringy people, and they're everywhere, but they didn't have any way to sort of find each other. And the internet created a platform where they could find each other. And Fringeware was an experiment in bringing those kinds of people together as much as anything, you know. And, um, and, you, and, and it's brought me over to the U.S., Yes, that's sure how you, you and remember, I met. Yeah. But yeah, the, yeah, the first time that uh, monochrome, so I, I haven't even told that yet for the people who, who don't know me. So I founded this art technology collective called Monochrome in like 1993. So that's almost like 30 years now. Uh, and the first time we did a performance or like the whole uh, idea of monochrome also started as a fanzine, like Fringeware Review monochrome was kind of like a like an austrian version of that so it was very cyber culture-y and uh, about uh, uh, fringe and interesting uh, topics and of course i i subscribed uh, fringe review back then and i also had a subscription of boeing boeing when it was still a print fanzine and and i i was always like ordering like fact sheet five and trying to find out what what new cool fanzines are out there so and i remember at some point i got in contact 
uh, with, I don't know with whom, with someone at Fringeware. I just like wrote an email, I guess. And uh, so when- I think it might've well, been me. Yeah, it might, might have been you. I mean, it, I was definitely also in contact with, uh, with Paco, Paco Nathan, uh, yeah. who was also a, around at that time and uh, a couple of other folks. But so it was in 1998, I, I remember it. So in 1998, we did the first, let's call it something like a monochrome US tour where we presented our fanzine, which of course was kind of like, useless because nobody could read German in the, in the US, but we did kind of like a little bit of a, like DJ sets and performance stuff. So we did a little tour about the crazy things that, that we do. And the first ever uh, uh, performance in the US, we did at the Fringeware store in Austin. Oh yeah. I, I, st I still remember it. It was like uh, some uh, like really great Friday, I think Friday night in September, 1998. <laughs> yeah, I had left Fringeware by then. And uh, <clears throat> I think so. Originally, we had a store that was in there was like a a larger store that leased parts of its real estate out to different people. Uh, it was called New Bohemia, and we mm -hmm. put a store in there originally. And uh, some controversy internally about whether we were going to have a bookstore or whether we were going to have something more than that. Whether we were going to have you know, like just all kinds of weird stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately it became more of a bookstore. Yeah, uh, I remember but the, I was at the bookstore that was 1998. And I remember next year I returned to Austin for some other reason. And the bookstore was already gone. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, that's it. Uh, some, some uh, I don't know, like some hipster clothing store or something was in it. Well, the and the community... I don't know. People moved on, I guess. I'm I'm not completely sure why they chose the fringeware store since I was out of it by then. But, uh, you know, those things don't always have a long shelf life. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm we were sort of ahead of our time, really, in a way. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I cannot believe that we as like monochrome as a group, we still exist. And we are like, we, we didn't kill each other, uh, like in like almost 30 years. But I think at some point, I guess it's also like, uh, I mean, how stable a community is also depends on, I probably like how fast it grows and and the different, you know, like the, the why people are part of a group. So m many people ask me that. So like, well, you're you're nine people in uh, at, at Monochrome. And of course, that, that number grew over the years. So in the beginning, we were only like two. And then we were three and four and five. And now we're pretty stable nine people over the last couple of years. And I think it only works because we kind of know each other very well. And we know why people are part of the group and what they get out of it. And I think if you don't think about that, you quickly run into the problem that all the bands have that people get jealous of the front man or whatever or something. Yeah, like that, that kind of stuff was happening with us. But, you know, it, really, I would attribute the success of your community partly to your own emotional intelligence. I, you know, I mean, I think that you're kind of a, a fairly even guy. You don't feel like a guy who would kind of get moody and go off in a corner and sulk. And, and you know, I was kind of like that back when I was doing fringe wear. I'm not so much like that now. Um, and I think that you know, just interpersonal things can get in the way. And it's really unfortunate, you know, it's like having bands that break up, as you mentioned. Um, it may be a great band, but the personalities just don't always work together and eventually things fall apart. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I well, think, yeah, I think there, at, at, at some point, like, I'm pretty sure there are already a couple of, uh, PhDs about like the the inner workings of of uh, of of countercultural groups and stuff like that. But I mean, it is true they tend to fall apart pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a question of how you hold it together, and and you know, some things do have a life cycle, and other things have you know a long life. And part of it is rolling with the punches, and part of it is. Again, as I say, uh, if everybody's fairly mature, then they figure out how to work things out. Yeah. Yeah. So, one of the problems with, uh, you know, breaking up like bands, for instance, I worked with a, a lot of them over the years. And the problem seemed to have always been external forces 
people coming in and say, well, you're too good to be in this bunch of people. You need to come join our bunch of people. And the same thing happens with, you know, countercultural groups. You know, someone would think, well, I'm going to make some money off this, so I'll lure this guy away from it. And you would see this happening over and over. It's only when people were stable in, in, in their relationship that the things seemed to uh, s- s- uh, hold together. Oh, yeah, that's uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if a group isn't really stable to begin with, or if they're like some internal, you know, like, um, uh, like cracks or like appearing or something like that, psychological cracks, then I mean, if like some pressure comes from outside or some, someone wants to, 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 to take advantage of that, of course, that happens <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Too bad. Sometimes, you know, like, and I mean, I've seen it with, with friends of mine who were part of groups, bands, or, 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 you know, like, uh, especially like there's a lot of drama going on in many hacker spaces, for example, where, where people do stuff. And the hacker space is not even that close to community. I mean, for example, the hacker space here in Vienna, uh, like it exists since, I guess, 2006. And there have been there. There were you can't imagine how much drama. Like people. Oh, leave, I can imagine. Back, oh, people leaving for a year and then coming <laughs> back and then this and that. And, oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I tur- I had a company that I turned into a co-op, and it worked out really well. But everybody was at a point in their life where they could kind of be cool about things, you know. And I think that that's the important part of it is you can't have people getting really frustrated and upset or getting into weird competition with each other and so forth and just the cooperative ideal itself like monochrome is a collective it's intended to be a a a cooperative which means uh to me it means that that people in the cooperative or the collective would be mutually supportive and that that would be part of the i don't know what would you call it the ideology of the of the organization right Mm -hmm. And you have to have some form of internal agreement about that. For example, uh, so, I mean, we, we do a lot of projects and some of those projects, it's almost, we have kind of like internal team leads for those projects. For example, Günther, uh, who's part of our group, he's very much into, so every now and then we publish books and he really sees himself as a book publisher. He likes that a lot. He like he gets a lot of kick out of like being able to 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 release another book. And that's almost like like he's almost always the team lead for the book publications. Uh, in my case, in the last couple of years, it turned out that I want to go more into filmmaking. So I'm usually directing the monochrome film productions like like uh, masking threshold is also uh, uh, a production of monochrome uh, but in that case uh, I took kind of like the creative lead and and did the directing and, uh, and, and and the writing on that but it doesn't mean that there is a, a form of competition between me and Günther because uh, Günther knows Johannes' thing is more the film stuff, and his thing is more the the, the, the book pl- uh, production stuff. And Frankie is more into building the robots and stuff like that. It doesn't mean that that we don't support him with that or we don't brainstorm with him. But it's always kind of clear who is um, who is in charge in a certain way, in a positive way, in charge of of a project. And so we kind of avoid with that kind of stuff that people that people. Uh, don't get also the kind of like the the public like I don't know like the the, the spotlight in a certain way at, at certain points and and people don't have to be jealous about things or they it's it's almost like I don't know it's like almost like an organizational dance <laughs> I don't know and sometimes well, no, I understand it sounds like out, yeah. it sounds like I mean it, ideally in in a collective or cooperative organization the leadership can be fluid and can be passed around and different people are leaders in different things. So it sounds like you guys had that nailed down pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. And for example, uh, I'm kind of like in in, in German, it's called Rampensau, which is a really great term. And a Rampe is like a stage and a Sau is a pig. So I'm a stage pig. So I'm a person who enjoys (laughs) being on stage. (laughs) I have noticed that. 
Yeah, and and Frankie, for example, is not interested in that at all. He he like he doesn't he doesn't like it. So like he is really the tinkerer who is really happy when he can build kind of like a robot for like an hour uh, a, a day and and nobody talks to him. He's very happy about that. And then at some point, of course, he will present the machine and 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 get his applause for what for what he did but he never ever wants to go on stage <laughs> so he avoids that and i guess if you know what people want to get out of something so why people join a group or why they are part of it then then you can avoid those kind of like uh, cracks getting bigger i guess that sometimes happen well you coined a term context hacking uh -huh. talk about that what does that mean oh, yeah sure Absolutely. So the thing is, I mean, it, it goes back to the whole also existence of monochrome. So, so when, when I grew up, when I was a kid, like a, like a teen in the, in the 1980s, uh, I mean, of course, as mentioned before, I was a very nerdy character in a little town. I was online very early. So I had a computer and a modem, I, I think in 87 or some or 88. So I was online very, very early when I was 13 years old because uh, the friends uh, I had, they were friends of mine, but I really couldn't talk to them about the stuff that really interested me. So I kind of like found interesting people online pretty quickly. And uh, out of that general idea that I was interested in things that other people were not interested in that I knew the whole idea of monochrome kind of grew and I was always a kind of let's say political person because I mean I watched stuff like you know like Robocop uh, and and kind of watched it but also watched it as the political satire that it is that it was kind of like a warning from the 1980s uh, this should not be the future in 25 years. If we keep going like this, then the future will look like Robocop. Nobody wants that. <laughs> and in a certain way, it, it, uh, it's true. It's like the, the future is a little bit like Robocop in the year 2021. And, but I kind of got very early on that there is a subversive and a political element of science fiction and, and uh, that we can use technology in a very uh, interesting and, and subversive way. So the whole idea of monochrome was pretty much letting people know of things. So uh, I was interested in the internet, for example, very early on, but nobody knew what the internet was. So like, how can you <laughs> tell people about the benefits of the internet if no one is online? How can you tell people about it's worth reading a certain book because it has a like a, an enormous amount of wisdom and, and people should know about that. So the idea was, how do we get people to listen if they don't want to listen? So how can we trick them into being interested in something? Uh, and I always called that the, the uh, we have to find the perfect weapon of mass distribution uh, of an idea. And sometimes it can be a film or a computer game or a, like a performance or something like that. And then we entertain people and by entertaining them, we also can teach them something in a, in a, in a strange way. And, uh, and that is kind of like the root of context hacking. So, so it is very important where you put something. So if you do a performance on the street, uh, you can do the same performance on a public place and in a theater and although the performance is exactly the same, it's completely different because in a, <laughs> yeah, my God. Yeah, Speaking yeah. of performance. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, for example, that, that guy, it's a, it's a character I created. So we, we came up of the, with this like fake Soviet country uh, called Soviet Unter Zirkusdorf. And, and, and I'm playing the, the, uh, the, the Soviet ambassador of that, of that country in, in, in that picture. And so the idea kind of is uh, you have to understand where you're putting something. If you're putting something online in one specific forum is something different than if you make a film out of it or if you, if you, so there's like the context is really changing whatever you're doing. And uh, hacking is very important for me because I'm not really talking about info security all the time when I'm talking about hacking, but the, the, the backstory of hacking is, is way older. I mean, hacking is, is a term that was used, uh, for example, at, at MIT by students. Yeah, and, it's and more about experimentation. 
experimentation and pranking. So like if yeah. if they if they manage to put a Volkswagen Beetle onto the onto the, the roof of the biology department at MIT or something like that overnight, then people would say, oh, that's a great hack. Uh, how how did they manage to put the beetle out there? Uh, and I like it in that way. So like uh, a hack is doing something that you shouldn't do with something. So you can do something with technology that you shouldn't do, or you can do something with a with a with a social group or with a, I, I don't know. It, there, there are so many ways of of hacking systems. Well, you know, one hack that we saw here was uh, it put Donald Trump in office as president. I have to say, like that is in a certain way also the the, the negative aspects of nerd culture because I mean uh, uh, Donald Trump in office and uh, uh, if 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 you look at all kind of like the, the history of 4chan and all these message boards and Pepe the Frog and I mean meme culture and all that stuff, uh, I mean Trump is at least like a certain amount of that of, of meme culture is is responsible for 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 Trump being being in office. Yeah, yeah I've and, thought and, about and, that a lot. How, you know, you can trace that back to some of the same kinds of things we were talking about in 1990, 91, 92, when, you know, things like fringeware appeared and <clears throat> uh, I don't know, Boing Boing Fact Sheet 5, all those things. We were bringing a lot of people together uh, who had not really been able to find each other before. And that's also kind of what the right wing in the U.S. has been able to do is bring a lot of people together, like rural people and so forth, and bring them into this sort of commonality and common set of beliefs. But they're, you know, I mean, it, yeah. it's I kind mean, of counterproductive. It's the dark side, absolutely. as you say. It, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, something like uh, QAnon, for example, I mean, uh, nobody really knows where it really came from, but uh, I mean, it could be as well like being a giant prank, like gone completely wrong. You know, I think it is. It's it's yeah. a lot like a role playing game, right? Uh, ab ab absolutely, yeah. And so, of course, and that's that's also what I say. Like the, uh, it is important in what context you put something, because, for example, uh, one one of the examples that I always bring is um, uh, come up with is the. Um, uh, many, many years ago, in 2004, there was this really, really great uh, prank the Yes Men did. And I'm, I'm sure you know the Yes Men. Uh, and oh, the yeah. Yes Men, uh, they, they, they had some great political pranksters. And they did uh, the Bhopal prank. I'm not sure if you heard about that one. But the Bhopal prank was just like a short uh, story uh, that they wanted to address the fact that even 20 years after the Union Carbide uh, accident in Bhopal. Uh, Union Carbide, and at that time, Union Carbide was already bought by Dow Chemical, uh, didn't want to pay any reparations uh, to, to India and to the Bhopal region. So there was this like uh, spillage and, and chemical accident in Bhopal. And even 20 years later, uh, the corporation uh, didn't want to pay for that. And the Yes Men had this great idea of like, we want to trick uh, Bhopal into into talking about that or, or, or putting, putting uh, the public eye back onto uh, what happened in Bhopal in 1984. So what they did is they set up a fake website uh, and uh, uh, pretty much the corporate so social responsibility website for, for Dow Chemical, of course it was a fake. And the BBC uh, fell for it thought that this is really the corporate social responsibility website of Dow Chemical and invited uh, a spokesperson of Dow Chemical uh, for a live interview on BBC. And that, of course, was one of the members of the Yes Men. So suddenly, one of the members of the Yes Men uh, is live uh, on air as a Dow Chemical spokesperson. And uh, in that, uh, in, in that uh, interview, uh, like the yes man said that uh, they would finally pay uh, reparation fees uh, for Bhopal and that Dow Chemical uh, openly admits that they did something wrong and uh, and that was on live live television. Uh, of course, very quickly after that, Dow Chemical kind of like sent out a press release that uh, that was a fake and that is not the official uh, uh, position of Dow Chemical, et cetera, et cetera. 
But I mean, back then I really, I really liked it. And of course I read about it in some, you know, like uh, uh, interesting magazine or some, some art journal or something like that. And I thought like, that isn't really the Bhopal hoax exactly. Uh, uh, it, and the main problem I see with that hoax, and that's what I would actually say is the important part of context hacking is for most of the people who saw that interview live on television, and I think it's probably still up to that date, like 90% who ever heard about the whole thing, yeah, or like 99%. So the people who watched BBC at that day and saw the Yes Man uh, perform his, his stunt, still to this day, it's probably think that Dow Chemical is a really good company because they finally are paying reparation uh, money to, to India and, and uh, say that they, that they did something wrong and they are now paying money. Of course, they never paid money. So, in a certain way, it like just statistically speaking, most of the people who heard about that still think that Dow Chemical is probably a good company uh, because most people don't read art magazines or they don't read the New York Times or they don't read the reflection of that, of that prank. So what the, what, the, what the Yes Man wanted to do is of course shed light on that and, and bring attention to it. But I would still think <laughs> that the biggest Thing they did is do a PR campaign for Dow Chemical. Uh, and so whenever you do something, hacking or pranking or whatever it is, you have to kind of like pay attention what the stuff is really doing. Where is it really ending up? Or does it just stay being an inside joke for a couple of people who know about art pranks? And, and, and read art magazines or read the New York Times or something like that. And that's like, even saying that is, but reading the New York Times in the, in the meantime is a, is a very small percentage <laughs> of people. Uh, like pe no, nobody reads quality uh, magazines and quality uh, reviews of projects anymore. Yeah, you know, the whole idea of people continuing to believe that hoax is fairly common these days. We, we saw that during the whole Trump fiasco. People would be presented with video evidence or they would have personally viewed something that he said or did and still be in denial that it really happened because someone said, oh, well, that, that was fake. That was a hoax. And uh, that, that's become, you know, standard operating procedure in American politics. Now, anytime something embarrassing happens, oh, it was a hoax. Uh, Antifa did it. Or, you know, <laughs> and we've got, you know, that constantly happening. But, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you about, John and I are big fans of cocktails, big fans. And I noticed that you have... Uh, been involved with the Festival for Cocktail Robotics, and I ha I know nothing about it, but I would love to oh, understand absolutely. cocktail yeah. robotics. Oh, absolutely! And that's 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 a little me a little, little more upbeat than talking about Trump and failed uh, uh, pranks and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, well, in a certain way, it's also a, a, a nice context hack that we're we're doing. Uh, so we started that in 1999, so a long time ago. And the basic idea was that uh, it was almost the, the new millennium. I can't believe that the new millennium is now like 21 years old, but whatever. Uh, so and back then we had this idea of like, for so many years, uh, science and modernity has, uh, or, or maybe even marketing has uh, uh, told us that soon we will all have the flying cars or we have the robots at home. Uh, who make us cocktails and stuff like that, but it never happened. The future went a different way. Like almost nobody uh, uh, prognosticated or, or talked about the existence of something like the internet in science fiction, but everyone was talking about like the robot who make cocktails and the flying cars and all that stuff. So in 1999, we said, it's almost the new millennium. 
we have to do something about that. We want the robots who make cocktails for us. So we started this festival called Robo Exotica. And the basic idea is we want people from all over the planet to come to Vienna uh, to present us with machines and uh, contraptions and automatons and whatever, who mix cocktails, who serve cocktails, who have bar conversations. Back then, we could even smoke inside. So we also had like... Uh, robots who, who, uh, uh, who light cigarettes and other things that we deemed uh, worthy of cocktail culture and bar culture. And so we started that in 1999 and we still do it. We just last weekend, this weekend, just like uh, yesterday I returned uh, from, from this year's Robo Exotica where I saw a couple of really interesting machines that were built. And I can tell you, I don't know, there, there are so many stories, I wouldn't even know where to start, but I have so, I've seen so many wonderful cocktail robots. I've seen so many cocktail robots destroyed and also burn and fail. And I mean, the, the beautiful failure, if people want to do something crazy and build it, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. But, uh, but I mean, the context hack behind it, I guess, also is that people, and that also kind of like leads to, to Trump and uh, vaccination deniers and all that stuff is that, that people live in a very scientific and a very technical society. And they use Facebook all the time or they drive with cars or they watch TV, whatever. It's all highly complex technological systems. And still they have this strange idea that technology all the time wants to hurt them or they don't understand it or they they start questioning science because they think like I don't know, like 5g will kill them or something like that at the same time they use cell phones all the time and so the idea was also people like cocktails and people like robots Ro robots are something cool robots you know it from science fiction stories and star wars and this and that so people like robots and people also like a good cocktail and like to have a good uh, bar conversation or li like to have a good party. And uh, uh, back then it was also that we went to a lot of media art festivals and the media art festivals are usually kind of boring. You know, like there always is like fancy media art and all the people are just waiting when the party starts. And in our case, we said like, it's the same thing. It's that the media art exhibition is the party. It's the same thing. So people come to Robo Exotica, and, and get crazy drinks from crazy robots. But at the same time, they kind of see how the machines work because there's usually the person who built that robot is standing right next to the robot and wants to see how the, the people are interacting with the, with the robot. And suddenly people have the most wonderful discussions about uh, philosophy and science and technology. And suddenly it's not that sc scary anymore. And they realize, oh, you can buy an Arduino for five euros and that's all you need to make this wonderful machine. And you need just like a couple of pumps and an Arduino and that's it. I just have to have a nice idea how to put it together. Oh, that's interesting. And it's in a certain way, it is also a way of teaching people uh, to kind of like enjoy technology and see how it works and, and also like take away the fear from them in a, in a, in a, in a certain way. And uh, and, and have a good time. So that's uh, that's one of our very successful uh, uh, projects. And we have been featured, I don't know, like in Wired Magazine and New York Times and you, you name it, uh, because people always like, oh, fuck, what? Cocktail robots? Why don't I know about this like, like you did? <laughs> what you're talking about there makes me think about two different quotes that kind of work together. One is, uh, you know, Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And then William Gibson said, the future is here and it's not just evenly distributed. Yep. And, and kind of the way it is, is that technology, the understanding of technology is not evenly distributed. And we have a lot of people who are so far from understanding it that it's just magic to them. And they sort of interact with it in the way that you might with magic, you know, mm -hmm. and, and misunderstand it and misuse it and, and fear it. And, and the one way to, to get past that is to create some understanding in their minds is, which is what you're talking about there. 
We, had, we robot group here in Austin did the same kind of thing. They'd have a big robo fest every year. They, they don't do that anymore, but for years they did that. And it was really about getting people to get more comfortable with the technology and understand it better and realize that it's not something to fear, but it's something to just kind of get your head around. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, the, the big problem is like, and especially for people like us who, who know a lot about that kind of stuff, it's sometimes impossible for us to even imagine that people don't know certain things. Sometimes I'm just like flabbergasted how, why is it possible that someone doesn't know that? So there is this, uh, there is like uh, in a certain way, but it's also like a form of privilege that you have to share. I mean, you have you have to share the privilege that that over the years you uh, kind of like accumulated a certain amount of of knowledge and information about certain things. And I I totally like that uh, being able to share that and and being being able to 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 let people uh, like, like, like into the circle of the knowing in a certain way, but, but not being too, too nosy about it. So I think, uh, I guess that's the, that's pretty much the basic idea of monochrome is like, how, how can you interest people in something, uh, and, and, and make it fun and make it interesting and don't, don't need to force people to do something. I think the a main problem is that, that the very moment, and it's so it, 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 it's so hard. I, I I see it all the time when I'm online, you know, like on Instagram or, or Twitter or Facebook or something. It's it, it's so hard to 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 resist the urge of just like thinking everyone is so stupid. <laughs> uh, and but then you have to just like step a little bit back and just like trying to to put yourself in their shoes or something or what where are they coming from why are they doing this and and sometimes it's just like hard because you just think of like they're just so stupid oh my god <laughs> why why and well we uh, should yeah. also talk about this oh yeah absolutely. our electronica <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's it's a project that we started in two thousand and seven. Uh, I have to say, we never had a big problem uh, getting people interested in that. Whenever I mention it, people <laughs> are just like, "Oh my God, what are you talking about? What is this?" And it's a, it's a festival we're doing about sex and technology, and how sex and technology are kind of like uh, related, or like how sex and te- how sex is stimulating technological innovation, but also how technology is changing uh, uh, how we have sex or how we date uh, and stuff like that. And the whole thing came out of, of an idea I had uh, in 2005 or six, because there was this almost like an urban legend. I thought it's an urban legend that, uh, that the, the internet only exists because of porn pretty much. <laughs> and uh, that many, many, uh, technologies only exist because they were they were the next possible uh, iteration of a medium to 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 sell porn or 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 distribute porn. Well, uh, online porn did drive a lot of innovation. A- a- absolutely, absolutely did. So I really wanted to know if that is true. So we did this uh, conference and we called it Ars Electronica, uh, and we did it in San Francisco in the basement of a porn production company. It was really fun. It was like an academic conference in a BDSM dungeon. It was it was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, we even had to start uh, the conference an hour late because they were shooting in the BDSM dungeon and the poor fellow who was performing couldn't come. And it just like took him an hour longer. And so we had to wait <laughs> for him to come for an hour, which is like this one of one of those things that that uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I did that. I yeah, whatever. Uh, so so we did that, and so we invited people uh, from all different kinds of fields, from history, like uh, hi- history uh, professors, and 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 people also from the porn company, people from from tech, from the tech industry, and people who do research about the history of technology. So we brought like twenty people together for like three days in San Francisco, and they all gave their perspective on is it true that porn is really a driving force in innovation is there something like pronovation as we called it and it is not uh, uh no it is true it is not uh, an urban uh, uh, myth or an, 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 an urban story no no it, it, it is true and we published a book uh, about it and so the first year 
was so successful. And we couldn't even believe that we, the strange Austrians, have to come to San Francisco to make a conference about sex and technology, because you would think that San Francisco, there is it's just such a sex positive town. And there is also like Silicon Valley around the corner and all the nerds are there. So we thought like, why do we have to start that? But well, we did. And then for, for many, many years, we did it in San Francisco. Uh, and, well, you found uh, your audience, that's for sure. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. In the meantime, it is kind of sad. So we kind of, uh, we, we're doing uh, Ars Electronica not in San Francisco anymore. We're, we're doing it almost like a traveling show now. And we do it sometimes in Vienna and sometimes in Berlin or something like that. We travel around because San Francisco got so expensive that it was impossible for us to even rent uh, a venue for 300 people for three days. We just they couldn't afford it anymore. It was just like impossible, uh, which is so sad. It's just like, it's also uh, like uh, many, many of the friends uh, I, I made over the years, like Scott Beal and, and uh, of Laughing Squid and, and many, many other people just like moved away from, from San Francisco. Uh, uh, Similar Austin. thing happening to Austin right now, by the way. Is it really happening? Is it is it already is it already yeah. starting? Yeah, the exodus. Yeah, property values are way up, and you know, cost of living is pretty high here. Yeah, and it, it, it's so strange. I, I remember when people told me ten years ago that they're all moving to Pittsburgh now because it's uh, it, it it it's cheap and there's a lot of tech industry there and lots of universities. In the meantime, I even hear from Pittsburgh that people are considering moving away. <laughs> Well, you know what I, what I always tell people is that if you don't want to stand in line waiting for a seat at a restaurant, just make sure you go to a restaurant that's not very good. And if you're going to move to a city where everybody wants to be, then, you know, you're going to be paying the prices. You're going to be standing in lines for things, you know, it's uh, yeah. and and that's what's happened with Austin. Austin has just flourished over over the years and and uh it's a city where people want to be so property values went way up and cost of pretty much everything here is high yeah yeah i can't believe like there there's some some of my friends still like they're artists and they they still live in san francisco for example and i can't even believe that they make it but sometimes you know like sometimes you, you you find like a landlord that is not like raising the prices or something. I don't know, but uh, yeah, people oh. find a way. That's kind of happened here. There's a lot of people who fled from Austin, but uh, there are plenty of people who are still. I'm still here, yeah. you know. And you'll be here soon enough. I will. At Fantastic I'm really, Fest. I'm really looking forward. It's interesting. Uh, I uh, because I'm 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 working on. Uh, on a couple of other movie projects and things. So like in, in the beginning, I, I wasn't even sure I could come to the States because at the moment there is still a travel ban for people from Europe coming to the States. US citizens can go to Europe, but uh, members of the European Union cannot come uh, to the US because there's still the travel ban. And, uh, but of course I, I like, first I want to work on my other films. I need to do location scouting and, and meeting people. And that is some of stuff you can't do via zoom. You just have to be there, especially if you're shooting a film. Yeah. Understood. It's completely, it's completely useless to, to make a, to make a zoom call from a location because it's just like, it doesn't work like that. And, uh, uh, so like, but I officially, uh, applied for uh, an NIE, a national interest exempt. So, uh, and I today got it. So uh, up until today, I didn't know if I would be really able to come to Austin next week, if the, if the Customs and Border Patrol guys would let me in. But now I have an official written letter from the consulate in Austria that says that uh, because I'm a uh, 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 I'm, I'm a valid factor uh, in job creation in the United States of America. That's why I can come to. The oh, US. fantastic. <laughs> That's great. So talk about the other films you're working on. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other film, uh, th that's the film that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm right in, like in pretty much like editing mode right now. Uh, but I, I still uh, need a couple of, of, of interviews and a couple of people, but like, I would say like 90% or 85% or, or of the material is already here. And it is, uh, it's called Hacking at Leaves. And it's, uh, 
it's uh, it's based on this like I'm not even sure it's very well known, but but uh, I read it a couple of years ago. There is this uh, it's a saying, uh, an old saying uh, in English. Uh, we need to stop. Uh, we we need to stop hacking at leaves. We need to to hack at the roots of a problem. And uh, that's why I thought uh, that is a, that is a nice nice term because of course. Uh, the film is also dealing with actual hacking, so I thought "hacking at leaves" is a is a really nice is a nice title. And and the story is that a friend of mine uh, started a little hackerspace in a small little town called Durango in Colorado. In oh yeah, Western I know Colorado, Durango. In in the Four Corners region, a couple of years ago, and uh, without giving away too much of the story, uh, they uh, were pretty much one if not the first do-it-yourself covid response team that grew out of a hackerspace and the problem was uh that durango although it's only like 30 40 000 people uh pretty much like in the middle of nowhere <laughs> uh they still had a, a major problem uh at the hospital in durango and also in farmington new mexico which is only an hour south of, of Durango, uh, but in New Mexico. Uh, and uh, I, I made a phone call uh, with, with Ryan because he posted all of that stuff on Facebook and all his like DIY uh, uh, stuff concerning COVID. Uh, and I wanted to know why, what is the big problem? Why is, uh, why are there so many uh, patients uh, at, at the hospitals in Durango and in Farmington? And he told me, yeah, the problem is the proximity to Navajo Nation. And Navajo Nation has a high number of uh, diabetes 2 cases. Uh, of course, they are very poor. And there is the whole, uh, the whole story of, of course, American colonialism and anti-Native American colonialism uh, is pretty much like self-evident if you look at the COVID numbers. So there were so many Navajo people who died of COVID. And, uh, and so suddenly this whole story of a, like a little hackerspace in Durango grew into the history of the US. And why is there something like Navajo Nation? Why is there something like Durango? Durango is a mining colony, of course. So suddenly, uh, like, a, a, like a, the colonial history that starts hundreds of years ago, suddenly has horrific effects right now uh, because of COVID and uh, many, many other uh, uh, illnesses before. So, so my, my story in a certain way is telling the story of the history of hackerspaces and the history of, of the do-it-yourself movement, but also the history of the United States and the history of Navajo Nation, and also the history of why the hell is uh, uh, healthcare such a big problem in the US and what why this like giant fuck up with with COVID and uh, yeah and suddenly like I just wanted to make a little short film about a hackerspace and their do-it-yourself story uh, and suddenly I'm, I'm, I'm making this like uh, like <laughs> the documentary that spans hundreds of years and uh, I, I won't probably be able to cram all the stuff into it that I actually want to talk about. But it's a, an incredibly fascinating, but also horrific uh, story I'm, I'm diving into right now. Ah. It sounds amazing. Well, I hope it's fascinating, be. really. I mean, I think you're like you you got your finger on the pulse there. You're touching the zeitgeist of the of the time. Yeah, but when, when when I did the whole thing, because especially if you do something, I mean, uh, like one one aspect, of course, of 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 the film is COVID. It's 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 one aspect. There there are many other aspects, of course, but it's almost like the the crystallization point of the whole thing. And when I was doing that film and I started working on it last, I don't know, March or April, like pretty much like when when the whole thing started, and doing it, I was thinking of, oh my god, this is never going to end. I'm 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 doing a film that has no ending. Where where 
where should I just draw the line to stop telling that story? And I kind of decided, and in the meantime, uh, it's almost like history. If you look, if you look back like a year from now or a year and a half from now, it, it, it sounds like ancient history, although it's just like a couple of months ago. And I, I, I said like, no, I have to, I kind of have to draw the line probably in September, October last year. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I had this feeling of like, uh, it, will, it will never be, like I, I, I had to let go of, of, of being able to tell the story to the very end, because probably the story will not even have an ending in a hundred years, in 200 years. It's just like, it's, it's, it's just ongoing. But at some point, of course, you have to say like, that's it. I cannot cover more than this, or, or that that's that's the task I have, and I can't do more than that. It's an interesting challenge for sure, figuring out where where you know where to terminate that film, but then you can always do more films. That is true. I, I can <laughs> sequels. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Well, we, and it's we, so, I mean, I still I still cannot believe that I'm going to Austin next week, and that my film has world premiere at Fantastic Fest. This is really just like a dream come true. And, uh, and, it, 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 and even like how the whole thing came, came to be is so strange. I, I, uh, a friend of mine from many, many years ago uh, works for uh, Rue Morgue and Rue Morgue is this horror film magazine. Yeah? Yeah. He's, he's, he's one of the main guys behind it. And uh, because we are in contact and I thought like, well, I'm doing a horror film. Uh, maybe they are interested in my little horror film. Yeah. So I sent him the link to the trailer and he said like, oh, that's cool. And then they published it on, on Rue Morgue. And a couple of weeks later, I got an email from the programming director of Fantastic Fest. And she saw the trailer on Rue Morgue and said like, that sounds interesting. I want to see that film. And I said like, well, I'm a very good nerd. I already submitted the film to your film festival a couple of weeks ago. So, but of course, here is the link, uh, Vimeo password. Uh, uh, I hope you like it. Oh, and that is so of, fantastic. And a couple of weeks later, I get an email from her and she says, she's not sure it's probably not working with the fantastic film audience. It's very, it's, she, she doesn't know and, 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 and uh, she, she she likes it, but she 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 can't she can't show it. So she, she pretty much like declines. And I was very sad, and I thought, but then again, I mean, getting into Fantastic Fest is such an honor. I thought, like, well, I had my chance, but whatever, it, 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 it's okay, it's okay. And then a couple of days later, I get another email from her, and she says, "I can't get your film out of your head. I I, I want to program it." <laughs> Oh, and I man. thought, oh my God, oh man, this is just like an emotional health skelter. And uh, well, and now I'm on a plane in a couple of days. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. I'm really happy for you there. So I, we've reached the end of our hour, unfortunately. And I do hope that you'll come back sometime and we can talk more because it seems like there's so much more we could talk about. Absolutely. It's, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.